other endocrine emergencies. So the endocrine system Hard mic. I just stand around and so if if I move it over here like this, yell at me. So endocrine system uh, controls uh, bodily functions by releasing hormones. Uh, hormones are chemicals that either affect other endocrine glands. So the uh, pituitary puts out hormones that affect the thyroid. The thyroid puts out hormones that affect all other. Um, uh, endocrine organs, um, so it's a it's sort of a uh, check and balance system, um, and then the endocrine hormones affect other bodily systems as well. And I'm not going to even read the rest, which is Mark's comment. Uh, <laughs> endocrine uh, e endocrine glands release hormones directly into the blood which transport the hormones then to the target tissue. The exocrine system transports hormones to target tissue via ducts that directly go to the uh, other uh, organs. So the uh, pancreas, the endocrine pancreas is located behind the stomach. It's actually retroperitoneal, most of it, uh, between the spleen and the duodenum. And the action glands in the, uh, uh, the that produce the uh, hormones and uh, other secretions of the pancreas are the islets of Longerhans. Obviously, Longerhans was a, I guess, a Dutch uh, uh, researcher uh, way back when. The alpha cells produce glucagon. The beta cells produce insulin and the delta cells produce somatostatin, somatostatin and gastrin. Gastrin is actually a, uh, not a hormone per se, it's a secretion and it, it assists in the digestive process. So it goes down, it's essentially an exocrine function, it goes down the duct system to the common bile duct and into the, in, into the bowel. The adrenal glands, we're gonna have a quick a quick search through the uh, uh, primary endocrine systems that we're interested in. The adrenal glands are pyramidal shaped organs that are uh, retroperitoneal, they're on top of each kidney. Up there. And um, the adrenal cortex, the outside of it, <coughs> produces the glucocorticoids and the mineralocorticoids, so the, the, the Cortisone functions uh, are produced in the adrenal cortex. They also produce androgens and estrogens, which is, uh, uh, they, they don't produce as much androgens as does the testis, nor do they produce as much estrogens as does the, um, uh, as do the ovaries, but they produce a fair amount of both, and uh, so you will see some uh, Sometimes adrenal tumors uh, producing ex excess androgens or estrogens, then they effeminize uh, uh, men and masculinize women uh, from, the an from the production of the wrong hormone, if you will. Uh, the adrenal medulla produces epinephrine and norepinephrine. <coughs> okay, what is diabetes? Diabetes from the Greek uh, means passing through or a siphon. Uh, I can see we move all up to the, Okay. Uh, diabetes mellitus is a group of metabolic diseases characterized by high blood sugar levels, which result from defects in insulin secretion or the action of insulin itself, or both. Gestational diabetes is a term uh, applied to increased blood sugar during pregnancy. 
uh, as a general rule, it is not, um, it, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't last as soon as the pregnancy is over, the blood sugar levels come back to normal, uh, doesn't, necessar doesn't require treatment per se. Um, sometimes associated with um, uh, larger babies though, uh, probably lots of sugar available to them. Uh, uh, diabetes insipidus is not diabetes at all. Diabetes insipidus is an inability of the kidney to conserve water, uh, which uh, leads to uh, thirst, uh, frequent urination, basically a dehydrational kind of thing. <clears throat> well, glucose or dextrose is the primary energy source for your body. You either ingest it or it's converted from dietary sources. It's produced in the body by liver, by the liver, in a process called gluconeogenesis. Now, as I promised, I'm going to give you about 20 minutes now of the Krebs cycle so we can understand. <laughs> uh, glucose is a big, it's a big molecule, and due to its shape, <laughs> And for it cannot diffuse through the cell without assistance. Most things go across the cell uh, by simple diffusion, but glucose can't do that because it's a big chunky thing. So there are specific glucose transport proteins that help. Now they're located in all cells of the body, but in a, in a moment I'll get, I hope I'll get to the thing. If, we don't have the right. There we go. Good. Now, there's a couple things to, a couple chemical terms to understand. The term chemical, uh, coupled reaction. That's a chemical reaction that has a common intermediate in which energy is transferred from one side of the reaction to the other. Now, blah, 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 blah. Now, what that means, and here's, here's a formula. So. We've got ATP plus glucose. So energy source, ATP, that's uh, adenosine triphosphate is your basic energy source. It's, a ch it, it's a, basically a charged particle which can transfer a proton. And the proton, H plus proton is the energy block that runs sort of our, all of our cells. ATP plus glucose goes to ADP, it took the proton out, and it's it becomes glucose 1-phosphate. You think, well, big deal. Okay, but glucose 1-phosphate plus fructose, which is a big, even a bigger, it's a double sugar, then goes, gives, a, gives back a phosphate, which is a charged particle, and you end up with sucrose. So that process, that process transfers a proton from one source to the other source and makes what you want. Make, the thing is to get the sucrose. So a molecule of sucrose is formed via the energy in ATP, but you get it back, or most of it, which is kind of fun. Now, free energy is the amount of energy released by the complete oxidation of food. And there's where we get to the famous Krebs cycle, but we're not going to do that. When you, eat, when you eat carbohydrates, most of the carbohydrates we eat are glucose, about 80%, fructose and galactose. The liver converts the fructose and galactose to glucose. Now that requires energy, ATP. <laughs> but it, Now, which is, which is one of the reasons why when you want, when the, in some diets they suggest that you eat a lot of large sugars, things that have fructose, things that have galactose, instead of eating glucose products because to, to use that sugar, you're going to have to burn energy to use that sugar to convert it to glucose. However, I'm here to tell you that's it, 
your body is so efficient that that's not a really good way to lose weight. Don't sit around eating a lot of uh, galactose and fructose to try to lose weight. It won't work. Glucose transport across cell membrane occurs through facilitated diffusion. The glucose carrier proteins, and I looked it up, and it's, I, I have a, you know, I think it's a, it was kind of a poor choice, but they call it GLUT, glucose transport proteins. So there are 12 glucose transport proteins in the human genome. Uh, we're kind of a combination now. We share some of those same glucose transport proteins with um, yeasts, with almost all other animals. We're almost a direct combination of the glucose transport uh, proteins in monkeys. monkeys and large apes, of course, uh, a lot of fishes. Now, I'm not going to go through all 12 because it doesn't make any difference. Now, only one of them is facilitated by insulin, and that's the one, GLUT4, which is in muscle and adipose tissue. So it. And, and you think about, well, why would they, why would they need some, the, the insulin is going to facilitate the glucose transport. It's, it's, it makes it go 10 times faster. Why would you need that muscle? Well, muscle, striated muscle, and adipose, striated muscle, because you're doing activity, you need to get <laughs> glucose into the cell quickly. How about uh, fat? Well, fat. The reason it works on fat is you want to store excess glucose in the form of fat. Glu glutose, GLUT3 is in neurons, GLUT1 is in erythrocytes, and also interesting in fetal tissue, and GLUT2 is bidirectional. It allows glucose to be facilitated either way in the kidney, liver, and pancreas. Now, that's very handy because you want to be able to get it in and get it out in the liver because sometimes you're going to store it, sometimes you want to get it out. And you want to get it in the, in the kidney, uh, you want to be able to have it, if it's too much, it'll, it, it'll uh, lose sugar, but then you'll bring it back if it's, facil if it's facilitated. Now the pancreas, that makes sense because you're, that's the sensing org uh, organ for low blood sugar because it wants to either, or high blood sugar. Now, why, why the big issue about insulin and only facilitating striated muscle? It's because it doesn't help particularly getting, getting glucose into the brain. Glucose in the brain is only requires adequate circulating glucose, which is why hypoglycemia gets the brain. The glu there's, there's, no, there's no assist in that. It just requires an adequate level of circulating glucose. This is my entire thing for the Krebs cycle and other things. <laughs> When you have normal glucose metabolism, which requires everything functioning correctly, being able to get glucose in the cell, whether it's with facilitated diffusion or not, glycolysis <coughs> ends up with, glycolysis breaking up glucose, ends up with four molecules, and that result produces two ATPs, two energy blocks. When you go through the Krebs cycle, those same, that same one molecule of glucose, you end up with two more ATP through the Krebs cycle, which is a little circular thing we always love. Then it goes through oxidative phosphorylation, which is you add the phosphate to it. That all is going on in the cell under normal, with normal adequate amounts of glucose, and that produces 34 ATP. So altogether, you get 38 ATP out of one molecule of glucose, which is really efficient. Now, gluconeogenesis, 
new formation of glucose occurs from in the liver by combining glycerol and amino acids and you can produce glucose in the liver. Now, this is regulated by low blood, uh, blood glucose level and decreased carbohydrate stores. The adrenal cortex, so part of the uh, uh, endocrine system, releases cortisol and that mobilizes amino, amino acids to form glucose in the liver. Insulin, remember, it's only, it's only going to facilitate the trans glucose transport in striated cells, striated muscle, and in fat cells. It's produced in the pancreas by the beta cells, activates those glucose transport proteins so that there's two-thirds of the body cells, striated muscle, adipose tissue. It binds with the muscle and adipose cell membrane and increases, essentially increases the permeability then of your uh, glucose. So it's about, it increases the function of glucose about, by, uh, of the transport mechanism about, about 10 times. And this little slide here shows that you know, if you have extracellular glucose on this line and intracellular glucose in the, in the presence of, of insulin, you get this direct rise of, uh, of uh, glucose intracellular compared to the control. I mean, that's, that's a pretty steep slope. Um, the half-life of insulin is only about six minutes. Which is why, in, in retrospect, we, after we figured that out, in, in, the, in the old days when someone would come in with diabetic ketoacidosis, after we'd hydrate them, we'd give them uh, an IV bolus of, oh, argument, maybe 10 units of regular insulin. And their blood sugar would fall a little bit, but then it would not fall anymore. And, and the reason, it was all gone within within 12 minutes, you literally are down to almost no functioning insulin at all. So obviously that changed our habit, so we started dripping it in. You know, you do the 10, 10 uh, units, or actually we, cut, we were able to cut it down to two to five units per hour just on a slow IV drip, and it was much more effective because of the half-life. Okay, well enough science here. In uh, what, what is diabetes mellitus? Carbohydrate utilization is reduced uh, and lipid and protein utilization is enhanced because you can't get carbohydrates in the cell and they have to turn to other sources for glucose. Now remember, <coughs> the, the brain and almost all the other tissue is doing just fine getting glucose into the cell on its normal rate as long as you have an adequate level of circulating sugar. It's the striated muscle that's that particularly running out of, out of energy when you don't have insulin functioning normally. So, Insulin increases the membrane permeability. It really doesn't. It increases facilitated diffusion. And when you get more sh glucose into the cell, you increase glucose phosphorylation just by having glucose there. Increases glycogenolis uh, glycogenesis in the liver. It's going to take excess sugar and make glycogen, which is a storage form of glucose. It's going to increase fat synthesis along with glycerol and, and glucose. You end up, I mean, you make glycerol, a fat, liquid fat, which then for storing, because you've got excess, when you've got lots of insulin and lots of sugar, you, you make fat, put it away. And it's a counter regulatory hormone, in the it, so it suppresses glucagon and epinephrine release, because glucagon and epinephrine have exactly the opposite 
effects. They're the, they're the safety valve for, uh, for low sugar. When your glucose falls, you have low blood sugar, glucagon is released, which and in the liver breaks up glycogen, producing glucose that's released into the circulation. Now, put this away in the back of your head. The, the, what you need to get glycogenolysis and production of glucose then is you need adequate liver stores of, glu of glycogen. And you can't get adequate liver stores of glycogen in a lot of diabetics, insulin-dependent diabetics who are not well controlled because they're not, their blood sugar levels are going up and down so much, they're not having adequate amounts of excess glucose to put away in the liver as glycogen. So that's why glucagon doesn't work sometimes. It doesn't always work. Now, with falling, besides glucagon being released, epinephrine and norepinephrine released which increases fat metabolism, which also leads to more glycogenolysis. Cortisol increases fat metabolism, so fats go to produce glucose. Growth hormone is enhanced. That affects the smooth muscle, which you basically steal protein from steel mu smooth muscle to produce glucose. Insulin production is now, is now inhibited. It's a counter-regulatory mechanism. When you fall glucose, you get, you get all these other things released, which suppresses any more insulin. Now, diabetes, the two flavors of diabetes is type 1 diabetes, which in which basically the body stops producing insulin or produces too little to adequately regulate blood glucose levels. Type 2 diabetes, pancreas secretes insulin, but it's partially or completely unable to use the insulin, so-called insulin resistance. Type 1 comprises only 10% of all diabetic patients. It's about 15 per 100,000 patients. Uh, and this is basically decreased insulin production. Now it may be an, it may be an abnormal form of the insulin, but in, 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 you know, in effect, it's decreased insulin production. Early onset, childhood, adolescence, the usual, usual time is about between 10 and 15. Uh, it's more common in the United States in whites than in blacks or Hispanics. All patients with type 1 diabetes, by definition, are insulin dependent, which means we have to give them exogenous, we make it up insulin to keep them okay. Along with, along with being insulin dependent, they're, and that should be dependent. Um, Increased risk of infection, kidney disease, ocular disease, nerve injury, hypertension, coronary artery disease, and strokes. It results from destruction of insulin producing beta cells, and it may also be associated with increased glucagon production by the alpha cells. <coughs> we don't we're not sure about that relationship. The peak onset between 11 and 13, often referred to as juvenile onset diabetes. New onset over 30 is very rare. Now, a lot of type 2 diabetics, which we're going to get to, over 30 are insulin dependent, but that they're not juvenile diabetics. All juvenile di diabetics basically are, are insulin dependent. There may be a viral association with this, environmental, more than likely genetic, even though new cases usually occur in the fall and the spring. Uh, but that's also when 
colds and flus and things like that occur. Uh, and still, after, after 50 years of my being in medicine, we still, 40% of new onset juvenile diabetics present to the attention of us medical folk when they develop diabetic ketoacidosis. That's their first major, it's not their first symptom, but it's the first time that really anybody pays much attention to them when they are semi-comatose because they, and, and that's usually an association with a minor, co, minor illness, which increases their basic metabolic needs, which drives them into more trouble. Symptom onset is fairly abrupt, and they, of course, they are prone to ketoacidosis. Now, clinical presentation, classically, polydipsia. So, that means increase, it means multiple thirst, big thirst. If you increase your blood glucose, that increases intracellular dehydration. You get blood glucose rising, and that essentially sucks water out of the cell, particularly if that glucose can't get into the cell. Then that gets to the kidney. Now you've got a lot of water in that serum plasma, and you lose water through the kidney. Then when things really get bad, when you get above about 180 uh, mil, uh, milligrams per deciliter of glucose. Normal is 60 to 110, 120. Uh, when you get above 180, your kidney cannot, cannot, it starts spilling sugar. So if sugar goes into the urine, it sucks water along with it. So they urinate a lot. And they're very thirsty because they're intracellular dehydration. Their hypothalamus is, under, is figuring out, God, we're running out of water inside, so it starts, you know, making you very thirsty. Polyuria, I've already explained. Glycosuria, osmotic diuresis, you get, when someone gets up to 300 blood glucose, uh, they're, they've got really sweet urine. Remember, that's how we first diagnosed diabetes, by tasting the urine. You know, first the doctors did it, then they hired assistants, and then we hired lab people. You know, that's how it works out. And the lab people said, God, we're going to make a test for this because we're not going to taste this. Stuff. That's how we first diagnosed diabetes. Diabetes has been known, I mean, medically since the Greeks, probably before that. They probably stole it from the Persians who probably knew more about it. So, and then polyphagia. So, polyphagia means you eat a lot. If you have decreased cellular carbohydrate, fat, and protein, I mean, your, 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 your cells are starving. So they start, so you really get, are hungry. Weight loss, because you're stealing proteins and fats away from any stores you may have, losing body fluid, and fatigue, because you can't get you can't get the glucose into the striated muscle. So there's where the fatigue comes from. Your striated muscle, the muscles that make you work and do things and play, you start fatiguing out. So polydipsia drinks a lot, polyphagia eats a lot, polyuria pees a lot, weight loss, fatigue, classic symptoms. Now, those are the ones that then, when they, when they get a cold, when they get a flu, uh, and they haven't been diagnosed yet, you ask, you ask their parents, and they, have, they, have, they been, have they been okay lately? They said, well, you know, we've been a little concerned because he eats a lot and he's just skinny as a rail, and who knows when an 11-year-old goes to the bathroom, you know? Um, so you don't know that they're peeing a lot. And they say, God, you know, he's, he's always running around, but, you know, he seems tired now, and I'm worried he's losing weight. <laughs> and then he gets his cold, and he gets, and it tips him over the edge, and they get diabetic ketoacidosis, and we get to take care of him. Type 2 diabetes. 
90% of all diabetic patients in the United States. In, in 2002, it was 6.2 of the population, and it increased to almost, almost double by 2012, along with the obesity. Related to obesity, somewhat the lack of activity, and certain other genetic factors, um, affects all ages, becoming more common in adolescence. We see really obese children now. With type 2 diabetes, in, because of just circuit increased circulating glucose, increased glucose in the urine, increased glucose uh, uh, basically uh, coming out, in, I think it sometimes comes out in sweat, uh, increased risk of infections. Uh, diabetics classically have infections of their feet, particularly, uh, particularly if there's, if there's poor, poor taking care of their toenails and things. Kidney disease, including all, all urinary tract uh, infection, uh, just increased sugar, a better place to, I mean, how do you want to grow a bacteria? You, you, you put it in a nice, warm, moist place and feed it some uh, sugar. Uh, nerve injury, peripheral neuropathies, hypertension, coronary disease, stroke. So they get the same risks uh, that uh, type 1 diabetics get. It can be controlled with diet, exercise, and weight loss. All the things that we as Americans don't like to do. Bec so we will take oral pills for it. And or insulin if it's bad enough. But it can be controlled by getting down to your appropriate weight. Type 2 diabetics may have normal insulin level or normal beta cells, but it's poor utilization of the insulin. Generally occurs over 40 years of age, although it's increasing in younger persons. Patients are usually obese and they will ultimately suffer end organ complications. Three times more prevalent in adults with lower socioeconomic and lower educational status, an increase in women with higher parity, which also seems to be often related to the above. Pathology of diabetic, you know, diabetes mellitus of whatever type to or one is chronic and acute, chronic dehydration with acute dehydration on top of it as it rises. So you get cellular dehydration and osmotic diuresis. Uh, another thing before I forget, uh, always think, well, uh, there's another slide coming up. Uh, there's an increase in keto acids because uh, because of the fat metabolism. And then when you excrete the keto acids, you lose sodium. You also have lower sodium because anytime you increase your blood glucose, you know, you have only just so much osmotic room in there. Normally, you will lose a little bit of uh, sodium that way. At the end organ, there's accelerated atherosclerosis. You get medial calcification. So in the media of the arteries, you get calcification. So you basically get severe atherosclerosis. Microvascular disease, which is typical of both type 1 and type 2, uh, which goes after your kidneys. So lest we forget, diabetes mellitus is the number one cause of chronic renal failure in the United States. And chronic renal failure is the number one cause of hyperkalemia that we see, although it does occur otherwise. Diabetic neuropathy um, is an autonomic dysfunction of the nerves. There's a demyelination of the nerves, and um, typically uh, they get uh, dysesthesias, pain, 
painful, uncomfortable feet, legs, they get, uh, or, or lack of sensation in their feet. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever had a, had a, a nerve injury or anything to your foot, but if you can't feel the bottom of your foot, you can't walk normally. It really affects your balance and then you're more prone to other injuries and things. Uh, that associated with severe atherosclerosis, diabetics, particularly type ones, typically get, they'll end up with ischemic necrosis of a toe or two and they won't know that they're getting, that they're having pain in their foot because they can't feel their toes and they end up with gangrene and lose a toe or two and, or lose an, ex, an entire lower extremity. Um, abnormalities of Schwann cells, uh, another form, another type of, of, of nerve demyelination. Now, hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia is a fall in blood glucose concentration that elicits symptoms of glucose deprivation in the central nervous system. So, sudden changes will give you adrenergic symptoms. So, sudden drop, and that's characterized by diaphoresis, pallor, tremulousness, tachycardia, visual disturbances, mental confusion, weakness. Those adrenergic symptoms are produced by what, what's happening. Well, sudden drop of sugar, norepinephrine and epinephrine is released, and that gives you the symptoms. That makes you think that if a person is functioning normally, they say, God, I'm, I, I think I need to eat something. So diabetics who are type one or otherwise who are used to being diabetic will eat when they get these symptoms. If you're taking a beta blocker, you don't have the symptoms. So patient, patient, diabetics on beta blockers are more at risk for developing severe hypoglycemia because they don't get the symptoms that trigger them to protect themselves. Now, gradual drop in blood sugar leads to fatigue, confusion, headache, memory loss, seizures, and coma. Well, this is all one picture. So slowly after their blood sugar drops, after they have or haven't been able to recognize that they're getting these symptoms and that they should eat, then they develop these other things. Confusion, headache, all the way to the bottom line, hypoglycemia causes coma and seizure which is not good for you. And interestingly enough, we used to treat, back in the 40s and 50s, they thought it was appropriate to treat schizophrenics with um, uh, insulin shock therapy, where they would give them a big dose of insulin, drop their glucose, and have them, and they would basically have a seizure. Uh, and generally, after you've had that treatment two or three times, you learn, that you learn, well, boy, whatever I'm doing, that's pissing them off at me, I'm going to change this because I don't want to do this again. Uh, it's very bad for you besides. Now, why do you get hypoglycemia? Well, primarily we're going to see in this insulin-induced hypoglycemia. They took too much insulin or they didn't eat enough food to cover the insulin that they did take. So it's usually in an insulin-dependent person or in the case of oral agents, there's something wrong with their adjustment. It's not working. And they're getting hypoglycemic from the agents. Now, alcohol also causes hypoglycemia, which is why, and it also covers up those adrenergic symptoms that you might have. And so you get someone, I mean, so classically, uh, 40, 50 years ago, when they came up with the, uh, with the coma cocktail, this is before the days of being able to test, <coughs> rapid tests for blood glucose, finger stick glucose, we would, everybody who was in a coma, 
or everyone who had just had a, um, uh, or everyone who had altered level of consciousness would automatically get 25 grams of dextrose, D50, automatically. Because, and the reason is we couldn't test for it. Why did they, you know, we don't know why they picked that number. There's no science behind that, by the way. Um, and we'll get to that too. But they, they picked that number and everybody got it. Um, it wasn't probably until the mid-70s that we had accurate gl glucometers. We also gave them Narcan as soon as we figured, as soon as we had Narcan <laughs> available as part of the coma cocktail. Um, some drugs, a uh, high overdose of aspirin will, uh, uh, too much salicylates will decrease blood glucose. Um, a lot of blood, a lot of hypoglycemia may be, may be factitious, but they shouldn't have any real symptoms on it. Uh, they may be able to fake their glucose. Factitious means fake. Um, so you can get spontaneous hypoglycemia rarely, which is why we always check for glucose. If we, uh, <coughs> short gut syndrome after GI surgery, uh, early diabetes, new onset type 2 sometimes presents with broad, really big swings in glucose. They get high levels and low levels, high levels and low levels as their, as their glucose, uh, as their uh, insulin uh, resistance is settling in. Some people have idiopathic, means that we're idiots, we don't know the pathology, and it just happens. Uh, they get hypoglycemia. Uh, some people have islet cell tumors. I've seen one case of uh, insulin producing islet cell pancreatic tumor. Uh, I've seen one case in 50 years. It's not, you know, it's almost never seen. Uh, some extra, some neoplasms outside of the pancreas can produce insulin uh, or insulin-like substance. It can be endocrine related to um, uh, Addison's disease, for example, which we're going to talk about toward the end, which is, which is uh, absence of glucocorticoids um, and, and liver disease. Make, makes sense. Remember, the liver is supposed to store your glycogen, and if the liver is messed up with your, with your alcoholic cirrhotic habit, you don't have any, liver, any glycogen stores, and your liver is not functioning anyway. So what do we do now with hypoglycemia? I, you know, I, I mentioned already that the, that there's no, the, the, the science is very minimal behind the, behind the D, D, D50, 25 grams of D50. And what has happened over many, many years, we've all noticed that you go to see someone who they got a blood glucose of 40, they need dextrose, we give them 25 grams of glucose. And for the next two days, they, their, their, their glucose management is totally thrown off because they had, to, it's too much glucose. So we've, adjusted this here and uh, a lot of places now um, to a, a little bit more scientifically based approach. So get your blood glucose. Remember normal is 60 to maybe 120. We're not ordinarily, if you have a fasting blood glucose of 120 or ab above 110 where you're suspicious for pre-diabetes. So a lot of the uh, uh, internists now think that 60 to 110, some of them even say to 100 is your normal level, but you know, we won't get into that. For our purposes, 60 to 120. You don't have to worry about hypoglycemia if somebody's got a glucose of 120. And you don't have to worry about diabetic ketoacidosis either. So if, the, if glucose is low and the patient is conscious, they get oral glucose whatever form of glucose you have. Now remember, if you feed them fruit, um, fructose, they're gonna, have to, they're gonna have to break that down to make it work. Um, so uh, 
we have that glutose, uh, other, other liquid forms, uh, uh, sometimes just sugar, which is sucrose, has, still has to be broken up. Uh, establish an IV if they can't take oral glucose and infuse 100 mils of D10. So that D10 has 10, has, has, one, has uh, one gram in every 10 cc's. So you want to give them 10, 10 grams, which is two-fifths of what we used to give them. Now you can repeat that if, they're not get, if they don't get better to a total of 25 grams. So you've got 20, in your, D, in your D10, you've got 500 cc's, 500 mils, so you have 25 grams of glucose in that. But all you have to do is give them enough to make them better. Then check their glucose. <coughs> now in a child, and this is the correct dose, when, you fi when we figured out how we used to treat kids, they were treating them at five point, 0 0.5 grams per kilo, which is, makes no sense at all. I mean, it, that little kid will be sweeter than anything after, after you're done with that. So a child's dose is 0 0.1 grams per kilo. So a, uh, and as you, and you do the same thing. Give it to them, see what their reaction is. If they, if they perk up and are perfectly okay, then they don't need any more. Check the glucose. If it's still low, you can give them a little bit more. How long does it take in between? It takes probably two to five minutes IV to see. But that's what we used to do with the DEEF 25. Now, the alternate dose, I said we have 25 grams of D50. Uh, what I would do with the alternate dose, dose is give them 10 grams and then give them more as they need it. Um, you, know, my, you know, my philosophy uh, has always been that it's, easy, it's easier to give small amounts and give more than to give large amounts and try to suck it out of them. It doesn't work. Um, if you can't establish the IV and the patient can't take orals and the patient's a known diabetic, give them glucagon, milligram, um, I am. A pediatric dose is 0 0.5 milligrams, so half of that dose arbitrarily. Remember, sometimes the magic doesn't work because they don't have any, any glycogen stores. Also, glucagon has gone out of, gone over the top in price. It's over 200 bucks a vial now. So, and the real treatment, of course, is get that IV in and get the glucose in it to them. Now, can you give it IO? Yeah. Uh, I don't think we need to get, for most of our diabetics, we don't need to drill them, though, because, you know, we can get an IV in them. They're not hypo, they're not, they're, they're not uh, hypotensive at that point. But if there's no response to glucose, Follow your regular altered mental status protocol. Repeat the glucose scan. Uh, do a 12 lead and a secondary survey looking for associated uh, other conditions. All patients who have gotten hypoglycemic on an oral hypoglycemic or on an insulin pump, and a lot of these people will have indwelling insulin pump now. Uh, any, any of those who, who develop hypoglycemia need to be transported to the hospital for evaluation. Now a standard ordinary, I'm taking, I, I didn't take, I didn't eat enough today uh, with my insulin, they have no other medications, they wake up, they're perfectly normal, they're 100% they're coherent, they are able to 
understand and sign your res refusal form. They're eating. They've got a normal glucose. You can leave. If, if they refuse transport, they can stay at home. They've had, they've had this trip before. But not if they're on an oral agent with or without insulin. Not if they're on an insulin pump because there's something wrong. Their adjustments have, ha they have to make adjust. They will all get hypoglycemic afterwards and may get worse. So bring them in. And then in general, any hypoglycemia of 50, even if you give oral glucose, uh, get an IV in and give them some, give them the, the D10. Yeah. Diabetic ketoacidosis. An absent or relative deficiency of insulin and an increase in insulin counter-regulatory hormones, epinephrine, cortisol, glucagon, growth hormones we talked about that are now trying to produce, trying to mobilize the body's resources to produce glucose because glucose isn't getting into the cell, particularly into the striated muscle cells. You get hepatic glucose production, you get fat metabolism, you get peripheral glucose, uh, the peripheral glucose usage decreases, ketogenesis is stimulated, and this is a very nice thing which we will we'll have the test on afterwards. Okay. So. Decrease insulin. Decrease insulin use. Increase blood glucose levels. Increase levels of hormones with, associated with stress. Increase catecholamines, growth hormone. Increase glucose production, more blood glucose. Increase glucagon, increase more blood glucose. Hyperosmolality now, polydipsia, increased thirst, dehydration. Diuresis in the urine, polyuria, more dehydration. Hypovolemia, shock. Increased ketone formation, breaking up fatty acids, increased beta hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetic acid. That's the, <coughs> those are the major uh, uh, ketones. That produces metabolic acidosis, which produces two small respirations. Respiratory rate in the 20s, uh, 25 and to 40. Central nervous system depression, shock, central nervous depression. So the whole, you know, you get ketones in the urine. We're not testing that. Um, the net effect, very, everything is all connected. You end up with a central nervous depressed person in shock with two small respirations who's extremely diet. Uh, um, extremely uh, dehydrated. So, ketoacidosis presents as polyuria, dehydration, sodium phosphorus, and magnesium deficits. They may have also profound total body hypokalemia. Here's the trick the potassium follows glucose follow sugar. So if potassium, if sugar goes, if sugar is high in the, uh, in the, in the serum and it's sucking water out of the cells, it's also sucking potassium. That goes to the kidney. They're urinating out large amounts of water, large amounts of sugar. Potassium follows the sugar and so they end up getting total body depleted of potassium. Two small respirations, postural dizziness, CNS depression, ketonuria, which you can't tell. Sometimes they smell fruity. 40% of us can't smell banana, fruity kind of banana uh, odor of ketones on the breath. Anorexia. Nausea, abdominal pain, thirst, polyuria, 
treatment is altered mental status protocol. You will then find hyperglycemia and they get a fluid challenge. Your primary thing is to treat the dehydration and shock. Dehydration primarily. I, I want them to have at least, for an adult, at least a thousand cc's of, of normal saline in them by the time they get to the ED. We're going to give them more fluids. At about, after about two, two and a half liters, we'll check their blood glucose again and check their potassium. At that point, we'll start treating it with a little bit of science. We'll, treat, we'll give them more fluids and start treating them with uh, insulin in a drip. All right, let's take a break for about 10 minutes. Okay, remember then, ketoacidosis, polyuria, dehydration, potassium de deficits, as well as other things. Severe dehydration is the answer, uh, and uh, treat altered mental status protocol and a fluid challenge. A question at the break, uh, they had a patient with a history of congestive heart failure. He, had, he, had, he was in diabetic ketoacidosis. How do you treat that? You treat it with the same way. Uh, but do uh, fluid challenge, you know, if they're already wet, you're in a little trouble, but if their lungs are clear, treat fluid challenge, 250 cc's, recheck. Fluid challenge, 250 cc's, recheck. Same way as you do with anybody who's got a history of congestive heart failure. A fluid challenge doesn't have to be 1,000 cc's fast. It's 250, 250, 250. A little bit in, then you don't have to worry about <laughs> sucking it out. Um, Alcoholic ketoacidosis, um, the ses cessation of alcohol consumption after chronic abuse may, may occur in binge drinking as well, and it's associated with anorexia and profound dehydration again. Uh, clinical presentation, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, shortness of breath, the treatment of this is fluid resuscitation, and they're generally going to be normal glucose or hypoglycemic and you if you give glucose you increase that if you give them glucose which is the treatment that increases insulin production and then it, that halts the fat breakdown ultimately decreasing the ketones and mark believes that you know in doing the restaurant or restaurants on s sunday Hyperosmolar hyperglycemic non ketogenic syndrome. Yes. <laughs> Common in type 2 diabetes, but it is, ex it is extreme hyperglycemia characterized by lack of ketosis. They are not, they, they do not generate the counter regulatory hormones which increase fat breakdown. Serum glucose is higher than DKA. I thought, uh, I thought I had known the record. Uh, in, I treated a patient a few years back who had a glucose of slightly over 1,200 uh, in HHNK syndrome, but I have since read one of 2,000, which is like liquid, it's, it's like maple syrup going through your veins. Um, so they have glucosuria, polyuria due to glucose, neurologic changes, they may be, um, they may be quite shocky by the time you get there because of the hyperosmolar, they're urinated out a great deal. And they need significant fluid and electrolyte replacement. So the beauty of it is for us in the field, is that the treatment of HHNK is the same as the treatment for any um, diabetic ketosis is to treat them with uh, fluids, take them to the hospital. Now, 
there's a rebound hyperglycemia that occurs. A lot of times we get into trouble trying to regulate person's glucose uh, uh, with insulin. And uh, because the, of the counter-regulatory hormones that are produced when you, uh, when you make, when you give insulin, someone gets hypoglycemic, uh, then they release that, you release uh, sugar from the liver, um, and then you get hormonal suppression of, of insulin for about 12 to 48 hours, and it becomes a vicious circle, and you, so you end up thinking you've given the, so you've given the person, you've increased their dose of insulin because the glucose uh, was too high, and then the next time you check them, it's even higher. So, you give the person insulin, they get hypoglycemia. That releases epinephrine, which releases glucagon, which releases uh, glycogen, mobilized fatty acid, which gives you more glucose circulating along with the hypoglycemia caused by the release of insulin that releases uh, ACTH from, uh, which causes release of the corticosteroids, which makes the liver make more glycogen and, and then breaks up the glycogen to make more glucose. This releases, the, the hypoglycemia also releases growth hormone, which increases free fatty acids, which makes gluconeogenesis, which makes more glucose. It inhibits peripheral glucose use, makes more glucose. So the net effect is you think you are doing the right thing by giving them more insulin, but they get hypoglycemic and goes through this entire chain, and they get hyperglycemic. So people would constantly increase the insulin, increase the insulin, increase the insulin, and at some point they get a severe insulin reaction from hypoglycemia. Now the oral agents. Classically we have sulfonylureas, glipizide, gliburide, um, another uh, tolbutamid, which are the more common ones. They increase insulin secretion, may result in significant hypoglycemia. A carbose and migletol are alpha glucosidase inhibitors. They decrease carbohydrate absorption. The newer form, the, the more commonly now you see everybody on metformin, glucophage, it's a biguanide. It's called it decreases hepatic production and absorption of glucose. And then the newer ones, um, uh, the thiazolidinedienes, Avandia, Actose, they increase the effect of insulin. Now, often people are on one or two combination of these to control it. If they can't control it on orals, they will usually add a little bit of insulin to it. Now, with the metformin, we haven't seen as much hypoglycemic episodes as we used to see with the, with the other ones. I haven't seen a lot of hypoglycemias out there uh, compared to the old days. Now, insulin comes in basically three flavors. Rapid acting, which has onset of 15 minutes to an hour, and it'll be called regular or novulin R or humulin R or lisopro or semi lentate, but it will say somewhere on that R for regular. That's the quick, rapid onset. Intermediate, which has an onset of action of one to two and a half hours. NPH, humulin N. Novulin N, Lente, those are all intermediate. And then the long acting insulins have an onset of four to eight hours. That's ultra Lente uh, or long acting. I only tell you these because if we're going to treat, and we'll talk about hyperkalemia in a minute, if you're going to treat hyperkalemia, you don't want to use the long acting or the intermediate acting. You want to use the regular if the patient has regular. 
you want rapid onset. You don't want to wait an hour. So, <coughs> so um, the reason we have the three is that what, what people take insulin, usually they take, they take it twice or three times a day. So they'll take a mixture of the short-acting and long-acting insulins. So to get up, they have breakfast or they take their shot before they, they have some regular insulin and they have some longer-acting insulin. The regular insulin will cover their breakfast. Their longer-acting one will cover what they have at lunch. And then they take then they take another dose established by their physician <coughs> before their night their before their evening meal that covers their evening meal and carries them through the night now if it doesn't carry them through the night if they have uh, hyperglycemic episodes during the night they will end up taking uh, uh, another small dose in the evening some people take it three times a day uh, so we can tell which is the culprit by what time of day they have their hypoglycemic episode. If they have their hypoglycemic episode in the morning, that means that they forgot to eat breakfast and they still got their shot, uh, which I think, I think nursing homes, when they've got something to do, they, forget, they don't feed them, and they, but they still gave them their, they still gave them their shot. Uh, so it's the short acting that was the culprit. For our treatments, the same thing. You treat hypoglycemia the way we always treat hypoglycemia. Now, there are other causes of hyperkalemia than diabetes, but as Mark says, this is a diabetic lecture, so this is what we're going to look at. Hyperkalemia and diabetes is caused by a defect in the excretion of potassium, so you lose potassium or you, you, you don't you retain potassium in the serum instead of excreting it normally a cellular shift due to the insulin deficiency potassium follows that glucose clinical presentation of hyper, so most of our most of our hyperkalemias are going to be in diabetic renal disease and that's the most common cause of dialysis in this country is the long-term side effect of diabetes on the kidney. So kidney failure. Um, and then what we often see is people who either present that they've been borderline renal failure and now they flip over to renal failure uh, and potassium retention, or they have some other thing that, in, that, that compounds their chronic near renal failure, such as uh, um, uh, rhabdomyolysis from, you know, breaking a hip laying on the ground for 12 hours before someone finds them, and then they, they have muscle damage and they have rhabdomyolysis uh, uh, from myoglobin plugging up what's left of their kidney and then their potassium rises. Most of the time, though, it's that they fail to go to their dialysis for some reason or another. Clinical presentation starts out, now, your normal potassium is 3, 3.5, 3.5 to about 5.5 milli equivalents per deciliter. Now, At six, you start developing peak T waves. The P wave begins to flatten. You get an increased PR interval. Now they don't all, all those things don't happen. And everybody, every EKG is just a reflection of what, of what the um, vector, the vector thing of, of all, uh, of, of your particular heart is at that point. At seven, your QRS starts to widen. Now remember, some people already have a QRS widened because they've had a bundle branch block. 
around nine, you start getting deep S waves, and somewhere in the nine range, there's merging of your S and T wave. They begin to come together. And greater than 10, you've gone into idioventricular rhythm, sine wave, you, don't, you can't recognize a, a clear QRS, and then onto V-fib and arrest. So other signs, uh, patients will have dysfunctional weakness because hyperkalemia will make, the, make muscles not work correctly either, uh, all muscles. They have paresthesias, tingling, uh, areflexia, no reflexes, descending paralysis, uh, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. This is a nice, you've got some nice T waves there. So here's a couple of examples. So this is a potassium of 7, 8. Uh, you see you've got a nice wide QRS going already. Uh, can't, your, P, your P waves have pretty well flattened out and disappeared. You've still got peaked T waves, though. Oh, now we're getting a bradycardia. Always, always be a little suspicious when you get bradycardias, too. Potassium, about eight. Uh, still got peak T waves. Uh, now, you say, well, wait a minute now. These QRSs are not, yeah, it's a different person. They're all looking a little different. Uh, this one, ooh, these are nice big guys in here. Uh, the QRS is beginning to, now the potassium's 8.7. QRS is beginning to uh, is it now it's nice and wide, no, no P waves again. Always think, hmm, where are my P waves? What are the possibilities? Put it in context of the patient. Uh, you can say, well, God, could this be a junctional rhythm and I'm just not seeing the P waves? Well, yeah, but why think about that if you look at, a, look at an old gomer who's just failed, his, uh, uh, failed to go to a, uh, his dialysis? <laughs> Don't think all of a sudden he developed a Junctional rhythm without hyperkalemia. Now you've got a bigger one now. Uh, so, still got the peak T waves, but uh, things are, you know, you're sort of beginning to lose the uh, distinction between, the, between his uh, S and his T. It's just sort of running, running together now. And this will keep getting wider and wider and begin doing this sort of thing when you get up. We don't like to get the, put the ones up that have 10 because we don't want to wait till they get to that level. So it's kind of hard to find those. So three phases of treatment of, of hyperkalemia. You want to stabilize the membrane, uh, cause potassium shift intracellular, and then increase potassium excretion. So, to stabilize the membrane, calcium chloride first, 5 cc slow IV. That's membrane stabilization. At the same time, you could administer an albuterol, uh, MedNeb, um, that shifts potassium into the cells. Uh, um, that's, everybody gets about a 0 0.5 reduction of potassium, normal, abnormal. Uh, and then, after you've cleared your tubing, or use a different tubing, clear your tubing with a, with a flush, give sodium bicarbonate, one amp, 50 cc's. That also shifts, that, that alkalinizes the serum, which shifts potassium into the cell. Now, the reason we want to do this flush between is you give calcium chloride and sodium bicarbonate together, and that makes calcium bicarbonate, which is rock, you don't want to make rocks. Um, now, to get the glu if you if the patient has their own insulin, and not if they don't, if the patient has their own insulin, and they're and they're not frankly hyperglycemic, we give 25, uh, 25 grams of glucose after giving the patient five or at the same time giving them five units of their own regular, regular insulin. If they don't have their own insulin available to you, 
Don't worry about it. Just don't give them the sugar. Now, if, the guy, if you go there and the guy has a glucose of 350, you can just give them five units of their insulin. Drip it in. If you give them, if you give them D10, I'm not going to get mad at you if you forget that. I will get mad at you if you give them D10 and they don't have insulin available. Uh, and then uh, Lasix, uh, 40 milligrams. Even if their kidneys are not functioning normally, uh, they will get some renal potassium excretion. So give them the furosemide, unless they're frankly hypoglycemic or uh, uh, hypotensive, which you want to restrict that. Common sense. Okay, what are the com complications of diabetes? Renal failure, um, diabetic neuropathy, which you've already mentioned, um, which is hyperglycemia leading to hyperfiltration, um, and um, then there's micro and microangiopathy. The the the, the little glomerular filtration units get the, the capillaries get screwed up with atherosclerosis and you end up with damage and nothing works. Um, renal failure, the biggest problem with renal failure is it's hard to maintain adequate blood volume with proper balance of water, electrolytes, and pH. You get increased sodium, water, and potassium retention. Um, you retain glucose. Oh, you lose glucose uh, in renal failure, and of course in, in, in diabetes, that's your problem anyway. So you're losing glucose, and urea builds up, so they get hyperuremic, uh, which ultimately causes them to uh, uh, have, a, uh, have evidence of increased urea with a, what's called uremic frost. They get a white powdery look across their lips. Uh, kidney normally controls your arterial blood pressure, so this disrupts the renin angiotensin loop, and so patients with kidney failure end up with hypertension. Kidneys are important in regulating your erythrocyte development by producing uh, erythropoietin. If that doesn't happen, you end up with chronic anemia. So the patient has increased water, sodium, and potassium retention with loss of glucose and building up of urea, hypertension, and chronic anemia. Um, with renal failure, uh, you know, you really only have to uh, treat the acute problems, gastrointestinal pro uh, complaints, changes in mental status, uh, abnormalities during uh, and, and their blood pressure uh, issues um, and hyperkalemia. That's the biggest risk in the, in the field. So manage those and we'll be happy. Okay, other endocrine disorders. Uh, Addison disease, which is adrenal insufficiency. Uh, basically, the patient doesn't have cortisol or cortisol-stimulating hormones. The reason they don't have it is um, a couple of failures. Nowadays, um, um, it used to be that people develop Addison's disease as a side effect of tuberculosis and a few other things where the, where the, where the adrenal gland was attacked. Nowadays, the most common cause of uh, Addison's disease or Addison's crisis is patients who are on chronic cortisol treatment for another condition and then they suddenly withdraw that cortisone treatment. So suddenly, because now their, their uh, regulatory hormones have been suppressed, and so when their, when their cortisone drops, they, don't, they can't produce cortisone because they don't have the ACTH, the adrenal corticotrophic hormone is produced by the hypothalamus, which which stimulates production of cortisone. So they have simply run out of cortisone. Now, 
Occasionally, and it's become a cause celeb recently, um, uh, occasionally uh, children are born with, with, with what's called adrenal hypoplasia, which means they don't produce their, they don't produce cortisone, adequate cortisone. So they're treated for this with generally oral cortisones by the pediatrician. And they, but they get into trouble sometimes when they, when they're, when they get sick, nausea, vomiting, they can't take their oral medications and then they will have sudden withdrawal symptoms of, of the cortisone. The symptoms of an Addisonian crisis are dehydration, severe vomiting, diarrhea, stabbing pains in the abdomen, low back and legs, hypotension and shock. Well, this is what would be, you know, so, and then they also get hypoglycemia. Remember, the, the, the circulating cortisones are also uh, helping to do gluconeogenesis from fats and things. So, and these kids get sick, they're nausea and vomiting, or the adult get, hasn't taken his medication, they're not taking their orals, they end up getting hypoglycemic often and shocky. Um, and of course, in severe shock, they loss of consciousness. And, this, and an Addisonian crisis is severe shock with loss of consciousness, and that's a, and that's a, you know, a, a medical emergency. And you might well say to me, so how are we to distinguish, go out there and see a shocky person who's, who's got, um, who happens to be moderately hypoglycemic as well. How do we know what this is? I mean, I can tell you I have seen maybe four cases of Addison's crisis in, in my lifetime, probably, you know, and they were all from, from withdrawal of their oral medications, they didn't they either ran out of money for their pills or they just stopped taking them. So how would I know? Well, you do things. You do the history. You look for a medic alert tag, et cetera. And then you do an aggressive treatment of shock. If you tumble to the idea that this is Addison's crisis, withdrawal of glucocorticoids, and if the mother is there, she certainly should be able to tell you what this kid has. If the if the person is there, and I think anybody who has got, who has Addison's disease should have a medical alert tag on or some way to tell you that this is trouble. Then you treat them, so, but you're gonna treat them aggressively for shock, which is the preferred treatment anyway. Fluids, if they require dopamine, you may say, hey, this person is sepsis. As a matter of fact, sepsis may trigger this. If you tumble to the fact that this is maybe Addison's disease, then they need steroid replacement. And all you have is solumedrol, which is, and I would give them maybe double your normal dose, 125 to 250. And then D10 as needed for hypoglycemia. So it's not magic, what you're gonna, so you guys are gonna treat symptoms. You're not, symptoms and findings, you're not gonna, you're not gonna worry about making the diagnosis, per se. You're gonna treat shock, you're gonna treat hypoglycemia. If you are lucky enough to say, hmm, medic alert, says Addison's disease, yeah, throw the steroids at him. You know, I believe firmly no one should die without steroids anyway, so. Now, the other side of the equation, you don't have to worry about, because it's not generally a severe emergent situation. Like hyper, hypoglycemia is a, is a crisis. Hyperglycemia is an emergency you can treat with some, some time and caution. Cushing syndrome is the other side of the adrenal thing. Uh, it's causing, it's too much cortisone. Uh, and it's usually caused by pituitary or adrenal tumors, um, characterized by central body obesity, glucose intolerance, hypertension, excessive hair growth, 
kidney stones, menstrual irregularities in half the population, and emotional lability. It's not a dire emergency. You treat what you find. You treat what you see. Graves' disease, named after a person, not after what happens to the patient. Graves' disease is an autoimmune disorder which causes hyperthyroidism. Hyper, you know, the thyroid gland sort of adjusts your metabolic norm, your, base, your basal metabolic rate. And it also affects all the other glands as well, all the other endocrine glands, making them produce more of what they're producing. The symptoms of hyperthyroidism are weight loss despite increased appetite, anxiety, restlessness, tremors, ins irritability, insomnia, heat intolerance and sweating. These are all adrenergic sympathetic symptoms. Chest pain, palpitation, shortness, also sympathetic stimulation. Irregular menstrual periods, which will only affect half of the people that have Graves' disease. Muscle weakness. Difficulty controlling diabetes because of the counter-regulatory hormone issues. Increase norepinephrine, increase epinephrine, increase cortisol. Goiter. If you can feel the thyroid, it's abnormal. Prominent bulging eyes, characteristic of, you know, that scary look, that, ooh. <laughs> now, there are some, I saw a movie there that an actress, I thought, God almighty, does she have Graves' disease? But no, that's just the way she is, I guess. Um, vision problems, such as double vision, uh, mu uh, muscle control. Now, the bad thing is sometimes people with Graves' disease, with hyperthyroidism, end up going on to what's called a thyroid storm, which has a 90% mortality. That's a lot. There should, be a, there should be some sort of a foundation out there for this. Uh, so, they have to have thyrotoxicosis to start with, Graves' disease, hyperthyroidism. And then, oh, it, may, it may not be diagnosed yet, um, and then something triggers it to the thyroid storm. Sepsis, surgery, any stress thing, increasing stress, increasing stress, also increases your normal stress hormones, which makes the thyroid just go totally nuts. Anesthesia induction sometimes will do it. Anticholinergic and adrenergic drugs. NSAIDs has been known, have been known to do it. You know, it's a bad side effect of, of uh, Advil. Um, excessive intake of thyroid hormone. Some people with quote, low energy, think that they need to take thyroid, um, and there are lots of natural, uh, natural and unnatural sources of thyroid, non-compliant with their anti-thyroid treatment, direct trauma or vigorous palpation. So very rarely someone will get hit in the neck or vigorous rubbing of the neck and end up with uh, a release of of thyroid hormone. And then toxemia and labor will kick it off sometimes. But you have to remember, you have to be, you have to have uh, thyrotoxicosis to start with. Symptoms of thyroid storm, fever, excessive sweating, tachycardia and hypertension early. Ultimately, they'll end up getting shocky because uh, their heart will be beating fast, they'll lose, uh, and the, it'll lose its uh, contractility. So it's a combination of both the rate and the, um, and the 
inotropic contraction. You, you get hypo, hypotensive shock late on. But early, it's hypertension, often uh, supraventricular dysrhythmias, often a flutter, a fib, high output heart failure, rapid, heavy beating, but heart failure. Agitation, confusion, tremors, seizure, signs of neurologic impairment, and look at them. They will, you know, you may find a goiter, you may find, you know, the buggy eyes, and occasionally they develop rhabdomyolysis um, and hyperkalemia. So this is a, an extreme emergency, and how do we treat it? Well, in the field treatment, we don't have a lot of things that you can do. Uh, you can treat it as a hyperadrenergic syndrome, Versed, to basically slow them down a little bit, calm them down. We would use beta blockers in the emergency department. We're not carrying beta blockers yet, but we would use beta blockers to do this. And then we decrease thyroid hormone synth synthesis, and the drug we use is propylthiouracil or methimazole, which is only in the emergency setting here decrease hormone release, we give them iodide, your, your thyroid hormone is iodine dependent, so if you give them more iodine, it stops, they stop producing hormone, shuts it down. Prevent further thyroid hormone secretion with glucocorticoids. Uh, if you said, gosh, why don't I give them cellulomedrol, yeah, that would probably not help or uh, probably not hurt. Probably is not enough of it to do it. We need higher doses to do that, but you won't get into trouble if you think that well. Uh, a couple of other endocrine disorders to think about. Pheochromocyto uh, pheochromocytoma is ordinarily a, a tumor of the adrenal gland that produces excess adrenaline, and it produces in little bursts. So symptoms are paroxysmal episodes of excess of sweating, severe, severe headache. Now, most people you see have headaches, have just headaches. <coughs> Racing heart, so headache associated with excess of sweating and tachycardia and palpitations. Now you say, well, could that just be an anxiety disorder? Well, yeah, the sweating and palpitation, but most of your anxiety disorder folk don't get severe, severe headaches at the same time. Anxiety, nervousness, shaking, tremors, pain in the chest, abdomen, nausea, weight loss, and heat intolerance. Uh, you know, if you see somebody with tachycardia, palpitations, nervousness, shaking, you're going to treat the palpitations the way you would normally treat it. So. Uh, nothing magic about that. Um, Hashimoto's thyroiditis causes hypothyroidism. Hypothyroidism is just the reverse of hyperthyroidism. Uh, they may have a goiter, they are, but these people are complaining of fatigue, weight gain, increased sensitivity to cold, difficulty concentrating, dry skin, nails, hair, constipation, the, the, your thyroid storms never complain of constipation, drowsiness, muscle soreness, general slowness. The extreme of that would be to go to extreme hypothyroid, which is uh, persons with, uh, you know, they have a thick tongue, very slow. They'll have a temperature of about 89 to 90, um, very very reduced metabolic rate, basically. Once again, not an emergent emergency. It's a treatable, requires replacement of thyroid hormone and, and cortisone, and, and you end up, uh, we end up treating them slowly. But this is not a dire emergency like the thyroid storm. Okay. Now I've got a few case reviews. If, my God, I found it for a change. And these case reviews are instructional for a couple things. Uh, 
Um, arrived on scene to find an 87-year-old female sitting upright on the kitchen floor complaining of right-sided facial swelling and a head laceration. Bleeding was easily controlled with a 4 by 4 Patient says she lost her footing and fell, recalls full event, denies level of consciousness. Patient was acting normal per the family. Tuck that one away. Patient states she activated her medic alert arm after the thing. Patient has a past medical history of dementia, coronary artery disease, hypertension, and a cabbage. Her, her drugs include aspirin, isosorbide, clopidogrel, denepazole, losartan, and famotidine. The, dene the denepazole is um, uh, the same as, um, oh, it's for, it's for dementia, uh, 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 Aricep, same. So what about the aspirin, the isosorbide, and the clopidogrel? What are they for? And what do they do? They all affect platelet aggregation. So, yep, right here, clopidogrel works on a, on the, uh, with a little ATP uh, or ADP, uh, works on um, platelet aggregation. Aspirin <coughs> works on thromboxane uh, A2, which also works on platelet aggregation. Uh, the di diprimol works on platelet aggregation. So she's got three drugs on platelet aggregation. Um, and her vital signs were pretty normal uh, for her, for anybody. She has a GCS of 14. I'm not sure how she failed, what she failed for that. She had no complaint of pain, denies head, neck, back pain on palpation, no neurologic deficits, lifted the gurney, loaded into MICU and transported boarded to legacy in the position of comfort and vitals remaining stable. Is that an appropriate transport? Okay. First of all, she, she's 87 years old. She did have a ground level fall, she, enough to hit her head, cut her head, so she at least needed to be um, stabilized she, at, with, with, uh, with the age, which is a possible indicator for trauma system entry, her age and her medications, um, we have to consider that as a reasonable trauma system in, uh, entry. Um, our appropriate spinal immobilization algorithm, long backboard immobilization, blunt trauma with altered level of consciousness, spinal pain tenderness, neurologic complaints, anatomic spinal deformity, high energy mechanism injury with inability to communicate, distracting injury or intoxication. Um, our spinal immobilization algorithm has really not changed uh, in 20, four or so years um, since we first published this back in 86, uh, 96. Um, so if there's a fall, et cetera, et cetera, you look at patient mentation, look at subjective assessment of pain, cervical thoracics, lumbar spine pain, numbness, tingling, et cetera, an objective assessment, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, deformity, tenderness, other distracting injury, pain with cervical range of motion. If yes to any, immobilize. If not, may transport without spinal immobilization. However, all patients who meet trauma system activation will have, at the minimum, application of cervical collar. If immobilization is impractical to a long backboard or leads to patient deterioration, put a cervical collar on and immobilize to the gurney. That's safe. Now, what happened to this patient? The patient went to legacy. 
the doc and legacy said, and we found about the doc says, oh my God, oh my God. Uh, so patient gets a full head CT, a neck CT, uh, also got a hip x-ray because by that time she was complaining of hip pain. Um, happily found nothing. Point is, this is, you know, why this head CT? Because of the medication she's on. Um, um, one of the, I, at, at the break, was chatting with one of the medics and they said that they had taken a patient with a simple ground level fall complaining of some hip discomfort to legacy, although with the patient's age and the fact that they were on Coumadin, should have, in retrospect, been made a trauma entry, at least a modified trauma entry. And that patient indeed did get an emergent transport uh, across the river to um, OHSU for an intra-abdominal bleed from the fall on Coumadin. So remember, little old people, older than 73, do not bounce well when they hit. Okay. Now, this is an interesting one because it's like all the things were done right except for one thing. Dispatched to a remote area for an 80-year-old male that tripped and fell, causing injury to his eye. BLS found the patient actively bleeding from the alley, but able to control with light, direct pressure. He was basically sitting up on the scene. Um, he had good eyesight bilaterally. He had been at a, it's kind of fun what we do around here. This guy, this is icky weather. He went up to a quarry because the family got together to use this as a shooting range. And when he was stepping on the rocks, which apparently are a lot of rough, slipped and fell and whacked himself. He had no LOC, but did complain initially of numbness and ting tingling to all four extremities. Now, it says here, almost subsided by the time they got to him. Placed on a long backboard due to comorbidities and symptoms. Complained of head pain and leg spasms, which was a chronic condition. Transported in full spinal immobilization without change or incident. Denies being on blood thinners. He stopped Coumadin a month prior, so he asked all the right questions. And did all the right things. Past history of pacemaker, AFib, cancer, arthritis, uh, benign prosthetic hypertrophy, chronic back pain. Treated with, he's on lisinopril, avidar, oh, a whole bunch of things. And Viking transported without incident. What's the one thing missing in this? He was not called a trauma entry. He did all the right things. Did a, so, and when he arrives, when he arrives, He's still complaining of tingling and numbness or some, some difficulty of managing his upper extremities. And indeed, he can't raise his arm. And he can't grip. He can push with his feet a little bit. So he came in on a end. Because he came in as a non-trauma entry, and that was sort of the, the, the message to them that just, you know, yeah, he, you know, he's not really a trauma. He had, I don't know if he, they passed the information that he had tingling or numbness or anything. Uh, and initially, they ripped off his collar, they ripped off her and sent him for some x-rays, CTs. Um, I can't, I can't, I can't excuse the ED doc for the exam or the, the scarcity of paucity, but at least the, 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 the trauma surgeon did see him 
fairly quickly, and his CT scan was negative. But he still had marked weakness, paralysis almost of his upper extremities, but still functional, some function of his lower extremities. So what does he have? He has what's called a central cord syndrome, squeezing of the cord from the fall like this, hyperextension squeezes the center of the cord, which gives you peripheral distal weakness and numbness over the upper extremity. Probably has dis well, he had, he had severe arthritis. We knew that already. And, and with the arthritis, he ends up with, uh, he can't, we can't do an MRI on him. Why? It's a pacemaker. <laughs> So they end up doing, ultimately, they end up doing um, an a, a, the old-fashioned old good old way. They did an angiogram, or a, or a myelogram, rather, uh, put dye around his, and did a CT myelogram, and he had severe stenosis, probably from the arthritis of C5 and 6, which increased the pinch then. So, He's gradually, gradually getting better, and, no, and, and actually the treatment, our transfer down, was perfectly good and perfectly protective for him. But it was, uh, but he was delayed in his diagnosis and treatment and kind of missed the fact. Now, so what is the, what is the trauma modification, modified trauma activation? Okay. Mech high, high energy impact, mechanism falls, adults. Uh, adults, we say more than 20 feet, children more than 10 feet, high risk auto crash with intrusion, ejection from an automobile, death in the same passion compartment, vehicular telemetry consistent. Has anybody ever gotten any vehicle telemetry around here? I haven't either. Auto versus pad, bicyclist thrown, motorcycle crash, Special consideration, older adults, risk of injury after increases after age 55. Children should be triaged to pediatric cable trauma centers, and, and, and the, the thing is pediatric capable. We are, Southwest is certainly pediatric capable. We won't keep them overnight, but we'll send them away. Burns, end-stage renal disease, pregnancy greater than 20 and paramedic judgment. Anticoagulation and bleeding disorders. So those are trauma, <coughs> trauma entry, modified trauma activations. Okay. Patient's wife called 911 for a seizure. States patient convulsing, with arms drawn up and jerking for two minutes. Later said, oh, maybe it's only 15 seconds. Say his patient never had seizures before, thought he was having a problem with his BiPAP. Patient complains of pains in his calves, feels his heart's racing, often feels a racing heart, had difficulty finishing sentences over the last two days. That ever happened to you? <laughs> Past medical history of an MI 12 years ago with a cabbage. Oop. Patient supine in bed, conscious, Post-ictal quickly becomes oriented self, location, zip code, etc. Skin warm, pink, and dry. Um, pupils equal and reactive. Patient has a trickle of pink tinged saliva, no trauma to lips or tongue. Heal surgical scar, good breath tones, pitting edema of the lower extremities, normal per patient. No incontinence with this seizure. EKG so bursts of VTAC with underlying rapid AFib. Okay, as we scan through this one, uh, first thing it says, uh, uh, at 2.06, uh, ventricular tachycardia, so right up here, comments, patient scraping four leads off by movement under a blanket. Hmm. Uh, that's one of the more interesting ones. Now the next interpretation, AFib. No sign of VTAC and initial 12 lead. Um, blood pressure 130 over 
3, pulse 170, irregularly irregular, pulse strength strong, elected to give amiodarone 50 milligrams, 100, 150 milligrams IV, um, blood pressure is 116 over 77, typical of giving amiodarone, remember it drops your blood pressure no matter how slow you give it. Then pulse is 150, blood pressure 124 over 76, um, AFib, bursts of quote non-sustained VTAC as an interpretation. CO2 was good, waveform was good, uh, not intubated, this is by the uh, just by the uh, the nasal sampler. Um, gets another dose of amiodarone, uh, has bursts of VTAC, multiple triplet, triplet PVCs. Unfortunately, it's not captured in this code summary, so we have to raise some question about that. And the patient does well and, I mean, is doing fine and it is now gets to the ED. This is this is her, this is his 12 lead. Um, any interpretation of this? Certainly is a atrial fibrillation, irregularly irregular. Um, they're either PVCs or at least, certainly wide complex tachycardia is in here. I'm a little interested in some of, the, I'm a little interested in some of these. Um, oh, let's see. This, this kind of a upsloping thing, this is kind of suspicious to me of a, of a delta wave. Um, I can't say that that's for sure, and there's no history that this guy has uh, Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. So I think this is Marty's review of the case at the time. 55-year-old uh, male, um, new brief generalized seizure, several days of transient expressive dysarthria. Um, patient was admitted and put on uh, Ticacin, which is uh, a new anti, dysrhythmic, I believe. Yeah, yeah it's like, it's like, um, it's like Sotolol or, uh, or, or those. Um, and then continue on Prodaxa, which is for his, for his anticoagulation, um, for his AFib. His head CT was notable for only mild chronic small vessel disease. He converted to normal sinus rhythm in the ED after diltiazem, so the pre-hospital amio may have been helpful. Um, Marty looked at this, said this is AFib with rapid ventricular rate. Not sure if there were any salvos of WCT. Uh, and I presume he did well after that point. Now, the choices were, what would you use to treat that if this was truly symptomatic? You know, the guy was not having any seizure in front of you, he was not doing anything funny. Um, could his seizure have been from a run of VTAC? I suppose it could have been. Uh, but this is certainly a wide complex tachycardia, and the medic's choice was, shall I give diltiazem to slow the rate, or she was concerned because he was on a, a beta blocker, and you know, our orders for um, diltiazem say, you know, caution in per persons on beta blocker. Because of two um, two drugs suppressing the uh, AV node. And then, 
if you look at the, uh, I'm happy she decided to go to amiodarone because the, uh, we say the caution for wide, complex, irregular tachycardia in with uh, diltiazem because this can be atrial fibrillation in a in the WPW, and I'm a little concerned that some of those look like delta waves. We don't want to suppress the um, AV node and get a, a nasty reentry circuit going through the um, through the bundles of Kent. Um, so I'm perfectly happy with her choosing the amiodarone, which effectively slowed the rate and probably contributed to conversion because theoretically deltaism doesn't convert the AFib. Now, if the patient had been truly symptomatic, in other words, hypotensive, chest pain, uh, um, onset of, uh, of uh, congestive failure, he should have been treated if he was unstable treated with cardioversion. You say, well, gosh, he's been in atrial fibrillation a long time. How do you know he's okay? Well, we don't know he's okay, but he's already anticoagulated, so the chance of him throwing a clot from the stroke is, uh, and, and getting a stroke from that is extremely minimal, if not there at all. The whole reason he's on the, the anticoagulation is to prevent that. So you can go ahead and treat that if you found it as such. But I think this is well treated and bring it up for the, for the cautions that you need to go back and review. Don't use wide complex tachycardias, especially if they're irregular. I don't want to, I don't like to see diltiazem used on those. Now this one is a learning episode and there's actually nothing wrong with this care. Per family, patient left for an extended period and came back not acting normal. Patient states, family states, patient found on floor, incontinent, no past medical history. She supine, sonorous respirations, and two episodes of posturing, after which she vomits. Uh, blood glucose was okay. Um, uh, she got naloxone with no change. She still in a GCS of three. Um, vitals were really okay at that point. Respiratory rate was 12. This is after the glucose scan and the Narcan assisted ventilation. Um, she was then intubated, uh, intubated with a 7.5 tube. Uh, auscultation of bilateral breast sounds, digital ETC, CO2 numeric and a waveform, and her uh, ETCO2 was regularly checked. She was given some midazolam. Uh, I'm not sure uh, if she was. I'm not sure why she got the midazolam. She's already unconscious, and then I don't see that she's waking up. But it's because you're used to giving that, I guess. Uh, Kepnography is 38, taken again after being transferred to hospital bed, got some more naloxone just for good luck, and no changes. Uh, so, now that's the way it's supposed to be. <coughs> Intubation, CO2 check, waveform, et cetera, et cetera. Check every time you move the patient, every time you do something to the patient. This is basically a talk about entitled CO2 and intubation. I don't care if it's done with RSI or if it's done otherwise. Entitled CO2 is the only definitive measure of ventilation. You need a numeric value and the waveform. This is the capnogram from the previous case. You've got a good waveform and you've got a good number. Capnography gives you instantaneous information about how effectively CO2 is being produced, how effectively it's being transported 
and how effectively it's being eliminated by the pulmonary system. If you get an esophageal intubation, either no CO2 is sensed or you get a small transient waveform, as in below, they just disappear. A normal capnogram is the best available evidence that the ET tube is correctly positioned. Your RSI protocol and your protocol in general, uh, but your I RSI protocol, if there's a difficult intubation, reposition, do the burp technique, change rescuers, try an Eschman catheter, use the NASCAR technique, use the King Vision. If intubation repeatedly unsuccessful, insert an eye gel. If you can't insert an eye gel or if it doesn't work, if you can't get adequate ventilation and a capnography on the eye gel, do a crike if you can't ventilate the patient or a needle jet if the patient's under 12. Upon successful intubation, confirm ET tube and placement by capnography and secure. Ventilate with VVM, maintain ETCO2 in the 35 to 45 millimeter range. If no ETCO2 reading or deteriorating waveform, pull the tube and reintubate. Trust your machine. We do not have machine failures. You can troubleshoot that tube. You say, well, my tubing is plugged. Put a new tube on quickly or pull that tube off and blow into it yourself. If you get a CO2 reading off that, you ain't got a plugged tube. There's nothing wrong with the machine. We have not had any machine failures. We've had, we've had some tubes getting plugged, secretions, et cetera, et cetera, but we don't have the machine, there's nothing wrong with the machine. So if there's no CO2 reading or if the patient is deteriorating, pull the tube and retube them. I'll give you credit for two tubes. <laughs> you know, that's not important. Okay. Are there any questions, any thoughts, anything? Okay. So next month is skills, um, and we'll see you then. At your station.